So I'm here on a, <coughs> I have an iPhone. iPhone is um, very short. I is from the Japanese word for love and harmony, and phone is for sound. <coughs> so it basically we stand for the love of sound. Um, our motto is researching sound in silence, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Sound is everywhere. Whether we want it or not, sound is everywhere and we always are taking sound in through our ears. We can't close our ears and even if we could, we'd still be picking up sound vibrations through our bones and skull. In fact, hearing is the first sense we use even before birth. But how much of this sound gets through? When do we become aware of sound and how do we listen? I tend to think that silence is omnipresent, it's, uh, it's everywhere, an enormous field out of which every sound is originated. The science behind this idea can be questioned, but poetically and metaphorically it makes a lot of sense. And it assures me of the fact that I can always fall back upon this fundamental silence. Silence is nothing to be scared of. The actual and real physical silence does not exist. Silence is the absence of any sound. Sound exists thanks to vibrating molecules and thus thanks to matter. There are sounds so weak that they can't be heard because they are below the threshold of human hearing, which is zero dB. There are sounds that have such high pitch that they elude the human hearing range. In fact, many animals conceive and perceive sounds in frequency zones that humans can't hear. Dolphins, for example, hear and produce sounds up to 150 kilohertz. Cats up to 60 kilohertz. Human hearing only goes up to 16 kilohertz with a, in, a, in a, a normal adult. And one more last fact, the world record for staying in an anechoic room which is a room that has no reverberations or no re a sound reflection whatsoever, the world record for staying in a room like that is 45 minutes. So 45 minutes is so far the longest stretch anyone has been able to endure total and other silence. <clears throat> so how does sound affect us? A sound can be alarming. It can warn us of impending peril, often long before we acknowledge it visually. A sound can transport us into a different place and even a different time. Just think of what happens when you're on the phone or when you're listening to music on headphones. This is also one of the reasons why making a phone call whilst driving is not advised. You are no longer behind the driver's wheel at that moment. You are displaced to a different setting. You might as well be reading a book while driving or writing a letter for that matter. <clears throat> The importance and impact of sound becomes even more clear when we talk about film. A movie is obviously mistaken for a visual art form. It is widely accepted that more than 50% of the impact of a film is about sound, and we're not talking about music only. I can only indicate how much effect is made on the level of a sound in a film. Without us knowing, certain movie scenes contain up to 40 layers or tracks of sound. Ambience, dialogues, and music are only a few. Then there's sound effects and all the other sounds that are added to increase the dramatic effect of the images. A simple car crash on screen exists out of an assembly of pre-recorded sounds, some of them from an actual car crash, some of a completely different origin. Some examples. A slap in the face is a classic case. Very often this is the sound of a sound designer slapping two pieces of meat, of steak, against one, uh, one another. The sound of breaking bones, ironically, often is made with vegetables, like snapping celery sticks. But sounds are also used to address the subconscious and to trigger emotions on a more subtle level. A good example I once read is the following. A car chase in a movie, underneath that sound and masked by the light, uh, loud screeching tire sound is the sound <coughs> of a screaming baby that's just very quietly mixed underneath that. Nobody will notice it consciously, but the emotional impact, as the sound of the baby is picked up by the subconscious, is immense. We feel terror and fear or panic, but not because of reasons we think. The amount of sound we are consciously aware of is merely the tip of the iceberg. It is impossible, and not even required, to notice every sound. One would go insane without filtering out necessary information. But I am pretty convinced that most people are mostly, if not completely, unaware of their sonic and often other environment. 
This is a pity, because most of the time sonic awareness is only activated in case of danger or irritation. Sometimes people have more trained listening skills for professional or passionate reasons. Doctors that listen through stethoscopes, psychologists listening to their patients or at least pretending to do so. Motorcycle aficionados loving the roar of a Harley Davidson, ornithologists. But still, most of the time, sounds go by unnoticed, even, even though we're immersed in a constant field of sonic information. If you have the time, go sit down somewhere and listen, as if you were listening to a piece of music or dialogue. Pay attention to all sounds that come and go, how they are sequenced, how they overlap. There might be rhythmic sounds, there might be recurring sounds. Some sounds have a constant pitch, others have no discernible pitch. Some are loud, some are quiet. And you might even hear real quiet sounds underneath louder sounds. Some sounds are complex, consisting of many layers of different qualities, like a humming drone of an engine that has a metal rattling it as well, and maybe the sound of running liquid is in there as well. Other sounds are just simple hits. And before you know it, you have observed and absorbed quite an amount of sounds and their characteristics. You could even go further by writing down graphically what you hear for one minute, or by picking out a sound and trying to draw that. This is one of the exercises we often do in a workshop. We let people record a short sound and ask them to draw it. There's a level of justice to be achieved here. I mean, for sure, the use of color is discussable and subjective, but there's no way that you can draw a hand clap as a warbly, furry horizontal line, or the sound of a running vacuum cleaner as a small, singular black dot. It just doesn't make sense. Um, Arbery Schaefer, author of the great book The Tuning of the World, describes the world as a big non-stop composition in which we are audience, performer, and director at the same time. There's no denying it, and there's no escaping it. All we can do is be aware of it and pay attention to it. By increasing our awareness for sound, we can also start to appreciate how sound affects us. Sound is known to trigger images and scenes in our dreams. Sound gives us a sense of space and time, informing us about more than we can see. Sounds can disturb, annoy, soothe, entrance, inform, and confuse. So, what can sound tell you, or what story can sound tell you? In the first place, sound informs us of what is happening, what's going on, and where we are. A busy city center displays a mixture of transportation sounds, pedestrians strolling and chatting, music oozing out of the shops, the belfry maybe. Lying on the beach, for example, there's the noise of the sea, playing children, the wind, or strolling in the forest, we can hear the rustling of leaves as we walk, the twitter of birds, the distant plane in the sky, maybe a subtle stream. <clears throat> as long as the soundscape consists of what we expect, there's a certain comfort and we tend to ignore most of the sound. Irregularities in the sound field are alarming. We hear first, and then we look for the source of distress and try to estimate if action is required to get in a safer situation. This is what happens in a normal situation, when we act as passive listeners, only listening when we are asked to do so. We tend not to listen to the ongoing narrative of the sound world around us. Now, I'm going to take a little sidetrack. Only recently I became aware of a certain nuance in the English language, and as I came to think of it in many languages actually, it is the nuance of the difference between sound and noise. If we go back to the root of that word, we end up with the Latin word sonus and the Greek tonos. According to Wikipedia and other sources, this was the word for sound, noise, tone, character, style, just all one word. What's important here for me is the fact that there's no discrepancies between sound and noise, and that there's connotations with character and style, even. So what does this mean? Today, I have the impression that the whole concept of noise versus sound is very dualistic. Noise has a negative connotation, and sound carries a more neutral or even positive vibe. We speak of the sound a clarinet makes, and the noise a machine makes. 
And if we refer to the noise the machine makes, it goes without saying that we are actually annoyed by it. One could even argue that if one speaks of the sound a machine makes, it comes across more tolerant or even descriptive. Sound is appreciated by a wide group of people, whereas noise is less appreciated and requires more effort to be appreciated. We talk about the sound of music and factory noises. By doing this, we discriminate and exclude a huge amount of information. In the first half of the 20th century, a number of people and movements increased the awareness of the sonic world around us. Luigi Russo and the Futurists, Edgar Varese, Pierre Schaeffer, Guy Debord and the Situationists, and John Cage. All of these people installed ways of thinking that increased awareness and invited us to listen to and experience the world as it is, without expectations, or at least with altered expectations and increased focus. Russo, in 1913, wanted to get rid of the sound-noise distinction and came up with the art of noises. Edgar Varez coined, the, coined the, the, the term sound objects in the 1920s as a system for composing in which he integrates musical instruments as well as percussion and non-instrumental sounds, such as sirens, and sees them as blocks of sounds or units of sonorities of equal importance. Pierre Schaeffer embraces the advent of recording technology to use recorded everyday noises and manipulate them into a musical composition. Guy de Boer invited people to deviate from their daily routines and take alternative itineraries from work to home and take some time to absorb these alternative routes and surroundings. And John Cage said that music is nothing more than organized sound and composed 4 minutes 33, for example, a seminal composition for piano or any instrument, where the performer does not play anything for 4 minutes and 33 seconds, thus putting all the focus to the sounds produced by the attending audience. So, how can sound, used? How can sound be used to tell a story? <clears throat> the way we work during an iPhone workshop is that we ask participants to write down one keyword, one idea, a concept, or an emotion on which to base their scenario. The scenario is a rough outline for the eventual sound composition they will make. This way of working helps them condense their thoughts, their thoughts and intentions. We have learned from experience that this can be very helpful to focus, because quite often, when faced with a blank canvas, things tend to end up all over the place and the result is rather chaotic and directionless. We try to approach sound in a musical way. Some sounds carry tonal information, some are repetitious, some sounds are subjectively very meaningful, some provoke fear or happiness, some are just sonic markers that tell a person where they are on you know, the road from point A to point B. All these sounds have meaning, as subtle as they might be. We're not necessarily looking for the big bombastic ideas or emotions, no, no, just the personal and subjective perceptions of people's everyday realities. The toughest nut to crack in this case might be in convincing people that what they consider as banal can help transfer their story to someone else. In other words, your trivialities are not those of someone else. It's worth telling your little stories. You never know what someone else will make of them. One of the most rewarding effects of working like this is that the class or group hierarchy often becomes very different in a normal situation, as in normal situations. People that are verbally not that strong all of a sudden have a lot to tell. Language and vocabulary as we know it gets pushed to the background and a more universal pool of expression is addressed and used. This once again proves the absolute importance of non-verbal expression or artistic expression. Not only sound, noise and music, but also painting, drawing, dancing, photography, video and so on. They all help to express what words can't. Nonverbal expression helps to expose relations and meanings that elude words. Even when listening to somebody speak, it is important to pay attention to any form of nonverbal information. Posture, breathing, body language, the silences and pauses in between words and sentences the prosody, which is the melody of speaking,
facial expressions, hand movements, non-verbal utterances. They all provide extra information that help us understand the information the speaker is trying to get across. There's also something else that plays a role here. Sound in general is one of the most explicit expressions of the time-space continuum. There's very little information that is so constantly changing in real time. Also, as an art form, sound and music are only possible in the time domain and are very consciously playing with time. It is there, and the next moment is gone. This is quite different to, for example, sculpture or painting or architecture, design, literature, and even film. Sound possesses the power of sucking you into the here and now, if you pay attention to it, if you focus. So it does take some effort, but it's also really worthwhile. <coughs> I'd like to quote John Cage on this matter. <clears throat> he said the following, Wherever we are, what we hear is mostly noise. When we ignore it, it disturbs us. When we listen to it, we find it fascinating. The sound of a truck at 50 miles per hour, static between stations, rain. We want to capture and control these sounds, to use them not as sound effects, but as musical instruments. Every film studio has a library of sound effects recorded on film. With a film phonograph, it is now possible to control the amplitude and frequency of any one of those sounds and to give to it rhythms within or beyond the reach of the imagination. Given four film phonographs, we can compose and perform a quartet for an uh, explosive motor, wind, heartbeat, and landslide, for example." End quote. In other words, and this is exactly what we do with iPhone, given an audio recorder, you can record your own sounds and tell your story with those sounds. We even try to get away from the linearity of the story, because usually we ask for a one-minute soundscape, but this can be a layering of sounds as much as a sequence with a beginning, middle, and end. It can be a sculpture or a collection of sonic associations. What's more, thanks to recording and montage techniques, we are able to take sound out of the time domain and sculpt, paint, build, and eventually tell our story with it. So, where does silence come in? As a conclusion, I'd like to point out the role of silence in all this. We know by now that silence is a convention, because there is no absolute silence. Silence is rather an indication of non-activity. When a teacher shouts for silence, he merely asks his pupil to shut up and make as little noise as possible, so he can continue making sound. In musical writing, there are symbols and terms for silence, such as rests or the term tucket. These zones of inactivity are necessary to unveil the pace and rhythm of the actions taken. In storytelling, rests and pauses are vital, not only for breathing, but also for tension and revealing the next step. A silence is a decisive moment. A longer pause in between two sentences can help ideas get across and gives room for the processing of information. When assembling an album with songs, for example, Quite some time is spent in deciding how long pauses in between sh uh, songs should be, if any should be present at all. Too little pause might render a sequence of songs too hasty or fatiguing, whereas pauses that are too long could destroy the pace of an album or break up the storyline. <clears throat> One of the things I like about playing albums on vinyl or cassette is the fact that you have to get up halfway if you want to listen to the other side of the album. The silence at the end of the side forces you into deciding if you want more. It's an invitation for action, a turning point, quite literally. The silence is the backdrop, the canvas, the projection screen, the ambience, the area in which the story takes place. Thank you.